Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. You can't overstate the importance of the church in the African-American community. Historically, black churches served as spaces for worship, of course, but before, but more than that, they became the headquarters for activists in the civil rights movement. To this day, they serve as a hub of political action and advocacy. But of course, time changes all. How have black churches in Middle Tennessee adapted? What role do they play for our communities today? That's coming up later this hour. But first, Murfreesboro residents have a few nick- na- nicknames for the landfill in town. One is Mount Trashmore. I like that one. Another is Methane Mountain. And according to a recent News Channel 5 report, that nickname really hits the mark. Hundreds of reports dating back to 2018 show methane emissions well above acceptable levels. Sometimes those levels were thousands of times beyond the threshold. Investigative reporter Levi Ismail broke the story for News Channel 5, and he joins me now. Levi, thanks for being here, and welcome back to This Is Nashville. Yeah, thank you for having me. Good to see you in person this time. I know, right? Yes, yes. (laughs) So, you know, this story involved, you know, combing through a lot of records. How did you know, where did you know Mm -hmm. to go looking? You know... It's like any other story where you get a tip from someplace. You may have been working on the story already to some degree. You know, I had been working on Middle Point Landfill reports, you know, for the better part of a year now. Um, But someone said, you know, you should probably look into the emissions reports. And I thought, okay, well, I guess that makes sense. You know, we're talking about a very big landfill here. And so I started, you know, trying to find these reports and, you know, good thing is a lot of this stuff is already online and it's easily accessible if you just know where to look. Mm -hmm. And so I started combing through them and one by one I looked and I saw, okay, well, it's supposed to be at a 500 parts per million. That's the threshold of when they start raising flags and saying, okay, you need to look closer into this. And I was reading numbers as high as 10,000, 50,000, 83,000 parts per million. So immediately that caught my attention. Mm -hmm. Um, And then of course you have to figure out what you're going to do with all that. That's a lot. That's a lot of methane gas out there. Mm. So how bad is the problem? You know, I would say that uh, we have to remember a lot of these records are going back years. And so, you know, Middle Point has, you know, committed millions of dollars into trying to improve the issue so that they see fewer and fewer methane exceedance levels and such. Um, But I would say, you know, at the very early off, you know, onset, you're looking at a lot of methane that's leaving this facility that is just escaping into the into the wind. And so when people ask, you know, why is the smell not going away? Why is that smell just kind of lingering? Well, chances are they're smelling a lot of either the methane or any other gases that are coming off of the landfill. So, you know, I would say it the problem has been there for a long time and people have noticed it's just they haven't been able to pinpoint exactly what they're smelling or what they're experiencing. Mm. Um, and, you know, when we're talking about methane leaving the atmosphere, well, where is that going? That's all that stuff that's rising to the air. That's contributing a lot to, you know, the the emissions that, that uh, um, many of us are concerned about when it comes to greenhouse gases. So we have all these leaks. What's the process for fixing the leaks? Uh, so for middle point, Early on, and this is the other thing that caught my attention, is that we're talking about uh, <laughs> methane leaving the facility, and the first response has was almost always covering up with dirt and mm. soil and clay and hoping for the best. And so if you see that uh, after the 10 days go by and you see that you know the, the levels are going down, well, then if it goes below 500, they call it good. If it stays there, well, then they try to make other adjustments, whether it's fixing a well here or there or, you know, uh, making some adjustments with, um, you know, uh, removing or, you know, moving these wells to certain areas so that it can better be, you know, it can be monitored a little bit better. But, you know, it's it's an interesting process. It's an intricate process that I haven't actually seen for myself because, you know, a lot of this is happening at middle point 
beyond you know our scope mm -hmm. but it's 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 a process that you would expect the powers that be t deck and some of the state officials to take a closer look into now is this method of putting down dirt and a whole bunch of hope is that standard industry practice yeah so i had a chance to speak to a number of um landfill engineers around the country and you know I reached out to them and they kind of talked amongst themselves and got back to me I didn't realize they had so much of a community out there but you know they got back to me and they said you know it is pretty standard practice to see people using soil but they also expect you to use some sort of cover on top of the soil to, so that the gases don't continue to leak out um, you know much like what we've seen over the past few years and you know I'm going through these reports and you know I, I don't see any mention of like covering you know happening sure they have this cover that goes over the entire you know much of the landfill um but you know as far as a certain area i don't see that happening mm. and so that's part of the problem that uh um, some of these engineers around the country said okay well if that's not happening you know someone needs to take a closer look um thankfully they're not seeing we're not seeing as many um exceedances of the 500 parts per million now than we had before but you know it was it was definitely something that uh need had to be brought up as as we know you know the you know, abundance of methane gas is really not good you talked a little bit about it what are the, the hazards of having these leaks at the landfill you know and this is uh one thing that i was hoping you know some of the um environmental experts could go you know closer into or you know dive deeper into um but you know we know that methane is not the only gas that's emitting from this landfill. And so if you see methane going up into the atmosphere or just leaving these wells and such, um, you know, you have to imagine this is a big landfill with a lot of things that have been dumped there over the past several years. There's other things that are escaping into the air other than just methane. So you might be concerned about methane, and, you know, and the greenhouse gas effect. Um, but what else is there that we haven't been able to pinpoint? Because, mm -hmm. you know, these records are only checking out the methane that's leaving. What else is there? And that's one of the um, reasons, one of the key reasons that uh, a lot of the folks in, you know, the Murfreesboro area, Rutherford County, they want answers so that they can actually sleep well at night knowing that this thing is right next door. I want to talk a little bit more about the people living over there. Don mm -hmm. Wilson has lived near the landfill for 17 years, and he talked to you about what it's like. Let's listen. Especially when it gets in your house, you don't get used to that smell. Especially on times when the wind is coming this way, it's really bad. And I mean, I'm not the only one that complains about it. Mm. What did folks, other folks in the neighborhood say to you? Oh, you, you will not have a problem talking to people living mm -hmm. next to the landfill. You go, you know, into the neighborhoods and such, and people will, they're glad to talk to you not everyone's comfortable speaking on camera, mm -hmm. but they're happy to talk to you and just say, listen, this thing has been going on for a long time. I need you to help amplify my my voice um, because they're concerned. You know, they want some sort of clarity. They don't know what's going into their, you know, into their homes late at night. A lot of these folks were saying, you know, they wake up in the middle of the night to some smell mm. and, you know, they're alarmed that they don't know if there's something going on at the landfill that's, you know, uh, out of the usual or something. But you know, you just have to imagine, like, being in these folks' positions, um, they were there, some of them were there long before the landfill ever came around. Mm -hmm. And so they're not in a position to just up and leave their homes that they've built lives in. Um, and here you come, and you're wanting to talk to them. Well, I have to remember, I can leave. Yeah. I can, I can go home. Um, but these guys, they're there. They live with the smells. They live with, you know, what it's like to be next to this landfill, knowing that one strong wind in your direction and, you know, that's that's your day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, they, they had about 2,000 odor complaints from the initial, um, you know, uh, opening of their odor complaint portal, the city of Murfreesboro. So you think about it, like, that's... That's quite a few people yeah. expressing just how they feel. Yeah, and this is all happening at the same time. The city of Mur Murfreesboro is suing Middle Point. On what grounds is the city suing? So the city is suing, saying that the Middle Point more or less tainted their waterways and have tainted, you know, the 
the air that they breathe. Um, so they're saying that there are a number of EPA, Clean Air Act, Clean Air, Clean Water Act violations as well. Um, you know, and they've pointed out different areas where they believe some of the liquid that's coming from the landfill is actually going into the waterways. And so they're saying if you're if you're doing that, if this is your responsibility and some of this stuff is going into our water, well, that's impacting not only our environment, but, you know, we're not too far away from the drinking water wells mm -hmm. out there. And so if you if you're if you're doing all of that, well, then we're going to go to the to the extent of suing you to force you to stop. And then after that, you'll come up with, you know, you have to come up with some sort of solution before you can start up again. Now, you spoke with the general manager of the Middle Point Landfill and asked him if putting dirt on top of these leaks was enough of a solution. Let's listen to a little bit of what he said. Don't take my word for it that we're doing things the right way here. And certainly don't take, you know, the city's word that we're doing things the wrong way. I think people should trust the state and federal regulatory agencies. OK, that sounds fair enough. But let's talk about these regulatory agencies. What did the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation say about the leaks? Well, what they're pretty much saying is that Middle Point is following the rules that they put in place in order for them to be licensed in the state. They're following um, the the criteria as far as what should be done once, you know, they find something that's above 500 parts per million. Mm. So. You know, it, it's it's almost like you have to remember who's the one who's calling the shots here, because Middle Point, it, by all accounts, is doing what the state says they should be doing. And if they weren't, well, then we'd find a lot of these you know violations regarding air quality, which we don't. And, you know, Middle Point is, you know, Mike Klassen was quick to point that out and say, you know, if you if you think that we should be doing more, well, that should be a question for the people who are in charge of regulating this industry in Tennessee. And it's not just TDEC, you know, EPA is also, you know, a, a part of that. And, you know, as far as TDEC's response, you know, I got uh, a limited response and it was really just, hey, if these guys are following the protocols of what we've set in place, well, then they're doing what they need to be doing. And, you know, we're, we're not going to add any additional violations or whatever just because it happens more often than you're comfortable with. Levi Ismail is an investigative reporter at News Channel 5. You can find the link to his story on this episode's post at thisisnashville.org. Levi, thank you so much for being with us, and thank you for your reporting. Always a pleasure. We have to take a short break. When we come back, we'll drop a pin on a black church in Hendersonville, which began many moons ago as a rock. Did you attend a black church? What does it mean to you? Tweet us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. A few times a month, we're going to take you out into the city with us to show you an ordinary street corner, a vacant grocery store, an inconspicuous bush in the woods. Now I know what you're thinking. That doesn't sound very exciting. Our goal is to peel back the layers on overlooked parts of our city and region, past and present. Today, we're dropping a pin at St. John Missionary Baptist Church in Hendersonville. The church has a long story spanning more than 100 years. Our producer, Rose Gilbert, first found out about this church while she was getting to know community members near Gallatin back in August, like Patricia Kelly Adams. Yeah. Mine's a 150-year-old church. Oh, wow. They built the church on the same rock that the slaves used to worship. They had to come down on the rock. I'm in Hendersonville, St. John of Hendersonville. Yes, it's built on a rock. It is built on a rock. That's church deacon Dr. Julius Brinkley. St. John Missionary Baptist Church is literally built on a rock, but he says it's also spiritual. A rock is solid, it sustains, and it represents strength. And we try to 
represent all of those qualities. The church is tucked away in some woods just off New Shackle Island Road and across from Drake's Creek. It's very shallow now, but of course when I was a little boy it seemed like it was to the roof, you know what I mean? Julius was baptized in Drake's Creek as a child 60 years ago, so it holds a special place in his memory. Though that memory wasn't always special. Actually, I was afraid because I was afraid of water. You know, this preacher is going to drown me, you know. But as I got older, it was something that I could look back and appreciate, you know, and I treasure it forever. A Drake's Creek baptism is a tradition that stretches back generations. Forever. I mean, forever. Literally, forever. Or at least back before emancipation, when this land was part of the Hunter Plantation. The people who were enslaved here used this very spot to worship and perform baptisms. Back then, there was no building, just the rock and the creek. Then, in 1891, seven men, including Julius's grandfather, bought the land from the Hunter family for $150 and built a church. And we decided to name it St. John Missionary Baptist Church. St. John's has been through a lot since then, explains head pastor Reverend Robert Earl Bell. During the Jim Crow era, he says it was targeted for being a historically black church. They burned it twice, and then they built the last one out of block. It was a block building when I came here mm -hmm. 38 years ago because the two previous builders had been burned. But they kept rebuilding on the same site, on the same rock, by that same stretch of creek. The quaint white building you see today is a 21st century renovation, complete with an indoor baptistry and stained glass windows. But Reverend Bell has tried to keep some of the history intact. As he shows me around, he points to a framed document hanging on the wall. That's the actual deed for the land when they purchased it. This is the actual confirmation. That meant a lot knowing when it first started, and that's why it's important that I put the uh, two different plaques out in the vestibule so people could know where they came from. Even still, that legacy isn't necessarily common knowledge among the congregation, especially its younger members. I had never known that the church had been burned down. Kyra Joy is 12. She's been coming here with her grandmother since she was born. She overheard me talking with the reverend and tells me it made her feel... Surprised, it made me feel like confused and lost because I've been like so behind on church history. But Kyra Joy is doing her own part to keep this church and its legacy alive. She always plays a role in the Advent play and she likes to sing in the youth choir. There's like church songs, old church songs that I know by word because I've been here for so long. 10 o'clock, let's get started. On a Sunday morning, I'm sitting in a pew with Patricia Kelly Adams, who I met back in Gallatin. I promised her I'd go to church with her. And say, speak, Lord, speak, Lord, to thy servant. To thy servant. As the pews servant. begin to fill in, Patricia points out relatives, church officials, and new babies. On stage, the youth choir assembles. It's hard not to feel the sense of life and hope here, even for a church that's been around so long and been through so much. After the service, Julia Sprinkley tells me, that sense of life is real. In fact, St. John's has seen a steady flow of new members. Well, I mean, we, we're constantly making progress. We're not stagnant. We're not. We're making progress through growth of the church. More members are joining as a result of the overspill of population in Nashville. And, uh, and a lot of the original members, particularly the young ones, they're returning back and rejoining the church. My next guest grew up going to another church that played a pretty significant role after emancipation, St. John's Methodist Church in Promised Land, Tennessee. Sylvia Edmondson Holt, thank you for being here and welcome to This Is Nashville. So, thank you for having me. Really wonderful to have you with us. So as a kid, you actually lived right across the street from St. John's. Is that right? Yes, I did. What was that like? It was wonderful. 
And to be honest with you, as a child growing up, I never knew that St. John was actually a black church because of my father and his singing ministry. He drew, uh, it was called Theodore Edmondson and the Promised Land Singers. They grew, uh, they drew so many people to Promised Land on Friday nights, which they called the all night singing. Mm. On Friday nights, I wish you could have experienced it. People of all races, all backgrounds, all denominations, all the way up to the Kingdom Hall, Jehovah's Witnesses were there, the Churches of Christ were there, the Baptists, uh, any denomination in the area, they were there to listen to the taping of the radio program that my father produced. And so as a child, I saw all these many people come into Promised Land to worship on Friday night, and then on Sundays, usually, my father and the group were performing at other places, other churches throughout Middle Tennessee and some parts of Kentucky. I was not always with them, but uh, I knew that they went to all churches. They went to white churches. Uh, I hate to say that word because I never believed that there's such a thing as a black church or a white church, but I do understand why at that time and even now. But I never really knew until I moved out of Promised Land that there was any such thing as a black church. We were just a big melting pot for all of these people who came together to praise God. Now, now tell me, how important was that church in your community in Promised Land? Oh, it was, it was the background, uh, the backbone, I meant to say, of the whole community. Uh, it had been there since uh, the early, I believe it was built in the early 1900s, um, but the community, of course, is much older than that. And um, uh, the land there was donated by my grandfather, great-grandfather, um, John Nesbitt, John and Ellen Nesbitt. They believed in education and wanted to um, allow the children in Promised Land to have an education. Mm-hmm. I went to that school for the first um, 11, I mean, seven years of my life. Mm-hmm. However, um, the church just was where everybody, you could, you could even find the sinners there. <laughs> <laughs> so a little everybody bit. Everybody went to church. Every- on, Sunday mornings, on Sunday mornings, my whole family marched across that road. Even the dog Skippy went with us. <laughs> And if we were lucky, if we were unlucky on a Sunday, one of the pigs might have gotten out of the hog pen and would meet us right there at the church. And so everybody, including his hogs and his dogs, was showing up at church. At St. John Methodist Church. That is wonderful. That is wonderful. I want to bring in my my next guests. Reverend Davey Tucker Jr. is pastor of Beach Creek Missionary Baptist Church in Bordeaux. And Cora Alston is senior pastor at Faith Church Out East. Reverend Tucker, Pastor Alston, thank you for being with us. Welcome to the show. Thank Thank you. you. So, Reverend Tucker, like Sylvia, you have ties to a church that dates back to its, its beginnings back to 1906. Tell me about that connection. Well, Beach Creek was started down in uh, Brentwood on Beach Creek Road. And as the demographics began to shift, it moved to South Nashville in 1969 and in its present location since 1975. Tell me about the legacy of a church that's been around that long and what it means to the community. Well, for me, the presence of the black church is a statement of resistance. It was often in the black church was the only place black people could understand the difference in the 
isness in the world and the altness. What do you mean by that? The way things is, it's not the way things ought to be. Mm -hmm. And so black church was often that place where you were told you were somebody and you were able to gather some level of hope that one, it wouldn't always be this way, but that God saw what was happening and maybe like with the Israelites, he'll come down and see and hear and change it. So um, that culture, that history um, is part to me and it's part and parcel of the mystery of the black church. Now, Pastor Alston, you co-founded your church. Yes. Why did you embark on that journey? We embarked upon that journey because we thought that that was a need and that also that we were led to do so. Uh, we embarked upon that part of the journey because where we are now located, there has always been a church in that particular section of East Nashville. And therefore, we are building upon that legacy mm -hmm. of uh, what has been and what we hope will continue to be. So we were led to go ahead and do that. Yes. Mm -hmm. If you're just tuning in, this is Nashville, and I'm your host, Khalil Lekalona. We're talking this hour about the historic role of the church in the African-American community. Join the conversation by tweeting us at This Is Nashville. So, you know, Reverend Tucker, you know, you talked about this role of resistance that the church played. How do you see that role evolving in the present day America? Interestingly, since uh, Senator Warnock just won re-election, mm -hmm. uh, before he was a senator, he wrote a book called The Divided Mind of the Black Church about a decade ago. And I think that's where we are. You have black church that have black people but then you have black church that has a black theology. And those are two different things. Uh, you have black church that has a black theology that believes God is a God of liberation. God is a God of self-determination. God is a God of compassion. And that's a strikingly different message than this Christian nationalism that we're in the middle of, and particularly in the Bible Belt, uh, one of your shows about the slave trade mm -hmm. here. Um, Jamar Tisby, a uh, black historian out of the University of Mississippi, wrote a book called The Color of Compromise, and how Christianity has always compromised itself as it relates to race. And unfortunately, the black church has participated in that compromise in places that continues to this day. Give me an example. When uh, black preachers come out to support a police chief that has a nefarious record of his handling of people of color, just last week uh, there was an event called Safe Surrender held at a black church, which was a state action to relieve itself of the over 30,000 unserved warrants. It's held at a church to actually leverage mm. that history of the black church. But the individuals who put it together says in the paper, well, we'll give you special consideration if you come over. Someone else says, well, what is special consideration? Can't you write that down? Is that the relieving of fees? Is that the expungement of records? Is that uh, providing bail if somebody needed that? Is that... Uh, settling cases instead of setting court dates. And so those are real-world examples of how the black church can be co-opted to participate in the oppression that continually goes on. But fortunately, there's always been some churches that know that without them and without the belief of a God that is not a respecter of persons, um, that has allowed black folk to persevere and even attempt to thrive in places where so many folks just struggle to survive. Pastor Alston, what, what are your thoughts on the role of the black church? The black church is constant. 
It is, it is a mainstay in our community, even though because of demographics it is changing. It's still a mainstay there. It's where we can come, where we can uh, feel a part of, where we can express who we are, where we can praise a God who we feel that has delivered us and brought us into a land of opportunity. And so what we're doing is in the black church is continuing to build up on that opportunity to continue to convey to generations that uh, all things are possible Mm -hmm. based upon uh, the Bible. Um, So we, we, we continually see this. And as we say, uh, even though the demographics have changed, we are now on a path of how we can be inclusive to all persons included in that uh, demographic so that we can continue to grow. So it is a mainstay. It is necessary. And it is a witness to the viability of the communities where they still exist. You know, it's good to recognize that racism and segregation can exist that they do exist in religious communities. It, to me, it seems antithetical to the doctorate of Christianity. But, you know, our, our, our guest, you know, Miss Sylvia Edmondson-Holt, she mentioned it at the top of the segment, that she feels like she never got the idea of having a black church. She never got the idea of having necessarily what's called the white church. But she understands why they exist because of the situation of race, race ethnicity, and these relations within our country. You just talked about changing demographics, and we're looking into the future as we're working to address these problems. How can the people who go to what is known as black churches, how can they really truly affect these changes so that we begin to look at our spirituality and our faith as something that's general, more so than these specific groups? Pastor Olson? I think we have to um, have a dialogue. I think you have to have a dialogue, uh, even though it's biblically based. Mm -hmm. You have to have a dialogue, again, that is inclusive because with the change, you have different segments. With the change, you have different beliefs. With the change, you have different concepts. So I think that at some point you have to have dialogue. You have to do sort of like Jesus. You have to walk among the people. You have to walk among the area and see what is needed and how we can bring the need together to be fulfilled with whoever is going to be affected in that area. So I I think dialogue has to be one thing. And each person has to respect Hmm. who we are and how we were brought up, how we uh, how we view uh, different things, as as uh, Pastor Tucker was talking about, theology, basis, churchism. Mm-hmm. Uh, and within that dialogue, again, you have to have that respect and see how we can reason together, because that is a biblical principle. Come, let us reason together and see how we can better improve this environment, how we can better improve each other, how we can uh, work together for the building rather than the tearing down. Reverend Tucker, how can we do this? Well, you know, uh, King said it, that uh, 11 o'clock is the most segregated hour in America. It still is. Um, The dominant culture wants everything to assimilate. We have um, members that aren't black but we're still a black church. You have to acknowledge some things, and those are the things that we don't like to acknowledge. Um, White church is white church. And it, instead of it typically changing for others who come, Mm. uh, it remains the same. So um, it's a person's choice. They have to acknowledge and they have to embrace a worldview that says that all things aren't fair and that God is fair. So uh, if that person chooses to come to a black church, that black church ought not have to change so other folks come because that black church is what brought my four mothers and fathers over. And I believe it still has something to say 
about today. Mm-hmm. So to um, alter it so it's less black, I find it not only offensive, but reprehensible, and it would be egregious to the legacy of black church. If you think about why they burnt down churches, often churches that didn't have electricity, didn't have running water, it was because individuals who were catching hell every day could go into this raggedy building on Sunday and come back out with some hope. Folk didn't understand it, but something was said, something was felt Mm. in that place that gave folk hope. And so let me burn that building down. But it's deeper than that, and we carry that with us. Um, Reverend Davey Tucker Jr. is pastor of Beach Creek Missionary Baptist Church. He was joined by Pastor Coral Alston from Faith Church and Sylvia Edmondson Holt, descendant of the founders of Promised Land, Tennessee. I want to thank you all for being with us today. Really appreciate talking with you. Thank you for having me. We have to take a short break. When we come back, we'll look at the future of our local black churches. How are these institutions adapting to the changing times? Join the conversation and tweet us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. We've been talking about the history of black churches in Middle Tennessee and now and how they've been integral to the African-American community. Now let's look at the future. I'd like to welcome my next guest. Omari and D. Lee is director of spiritual care at Nashville General Hospital. Morris Tipton is pastor of First Baptist Church of East Nashville. And Kiela Hampton is member of Born Again Church. I want to thank you all for being here. Welcome to This is Nashville. Thank you for having me. Really a pleasure to have you all with us. Now, Pastor Tipton, your church, First Baptist Church of East Nashville, is 156 years old. A lot has changed in 156 years, I have to say that. But, you know, tell me, how has First Baptist adapted over the years? First Baptist has tried to remain true to its vision of being a beacon of hope and light, being a an institution, a religious institution that uh, is primarily concerned with sharing the good news of Jesus the Christ. Uh, that's our focus mm-hmm. uh, every step along the way. It doesn't matter what you look like, where you come from, what side of the tracks you may be from. Uh, if ministry is needed in your life, we try to be a ministry that provides uh, hope and and real-time, real-life experiences to bring you up from where you've been to the places that we believe God would have you to be. Now, from what I understand, we see, we we all understand, we've done plenty of shows about the development and gentrification that's mm-hmm. happening all across Nashville. There is pressure upon you all and the congregation to sell the building where you all meet and worship. How are you adapting and dealing with that pressure? Uh, lean and independent on the Lord. Mm-hmm. Um, we continue to believe God has intentionally placed us at that at that spot, at that location, and continues uh, to make provision for us to stay there. Uh, we continue to do life-changing ministry uh, in that community and even in other points around the city. Uh, we do uh, um, uh, school drives where we provide, uh, you know, school supplies and all that kind of thing, uh, medical checkups and all of that for uh, persons in that community. We we reach out intentionally uh, to persons within that community, both white and black, uh, not only inviting them to church, but to, but to just share the good news of Jesus the Christ through fellowship, through love, through food, uh, and engage the community in that kind of way. You know, I wonder how gentrification affects black churches in particular. What have you experienced? Well, the thing that has been somewhat disappointing, um, 
I there was a, a period about five or six years ago where a, a nonprofit after school program was looking to come in and potentially use some space within our church. And um, the director of that program was a, a white young lady. And so we were sharing. And, you know, my vision is to have a a multi-race church. I, I believe heaven's going to going to represent everybody and not mm-hmm. just a particular uh, demographic. And so I was sharing with her that vision. And she said, one of the things that will hinder you is uh, white people don't like going and being the away team. I said, what do you mean by that? Hmm. Uh, when we come into a church, me, we being white, uh, we don't want to look up in the pulpit and in the choir and not see anybody that looks like us. I was very disappointed to hear that, but I found that to be somewhat true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so with the gentrification, where I grew up in a time where you walked to church, you lived near the church you attended, and you could literally walk to church. And so there are Plenty, there are thousands of unchurched, unsaved persons within our community, black and white, and we reach out to everyone. We literally walk the neighborhood with flyers, with tracks, inviting them to the various events we have. Um, You'll have some of the uh, African-American community that will come and participate. Uh, You don't have a lot of the white they come, and even on a given Sunday morning, uh, as we are coming in church, pulling in our parking lot, you'll see uh, some 20-something-year-olds that live next door to the church in the Stacks apartments, which are like $1,500 for a studio. Mm-hmm. They're walking their dogs, they're jogging, mm-hmm. they're waving, but they never come in. Now, Omarion, when you look at how Nashville is changing so rapidly, what role do you see the black church playing? Absolutely. Um, And thank you for having me uh, today, Khalil. Um, The role that the black church is playing is to still be that consummate place for African-Americans and for others in the community to gather. I think... um, the Black church just this past a tip and has lifted has got to be ready and willing to be open to receive and accept the community that's coming in. But the Black church just as well has to be ready to be expansive and move with its people as it has always done. I think in the previous segment, um, Pastor Tucker talked about the fact that how Beach Creek has moved and followed. Being an AME pastor, our churches have moved and followed the people wherever they were, um, from downtown, from South Nashville, uh, St. Paul, AME Church, the AME Church I come out of, moved from there to follow the people to Charlotte, follow the people now up to, off of Clarksville Highway. But in that same way of moving, there still has to, the, the, the new movement that the church has to take on, the new mantra that the church has to take on, is not only following those that you have, but growing where you're planted, where you are establishing a relevant uh, audience and crowd uh, with the people that are coming in. Mm-hmm. Um, that's exactly what, you know, I, I think that's what the mission of Christianity is, is that you uh, become all things to all people that that's there. So we support the people that are local around the church. Uh, the area may change uh, because of uh, people moving out and, and, and other groups moving in, but you still have to be there to minister to what is coming into the community. And that means uh, creating uh, some diverse uh, ways of ministry. Mm. Now, I wonder about young people. Kiela, how important is it to you to be a young person, yet such an active member of your church? Well, it's extremely important, first of all, because the Black church, um, in my experience, has been that constant. And it's been a safe space um, to be who I am in Christ and, you know, have those like-minded people who look like me, who think like me, who worship the same God that I do, but also affirming, you know, who I am as a person, even outside of the church. Um, So it's just, it's very important to have that space as a young person, because these are going to be the most formative years of your life. And you want them to, you know, ideally be spent in the church. Now, do you have any friends who aren't active in church? Oh, yeah, definitely. And I'm pretty sure, you know, just about everybody does. But, yeah, I for sure have uh, friends that are not active members of any church. Um, So, yeah. Well, what do they say to you about why they choose not to be involved? 
Well, some, it, it just, it varies across the board, honestly, but you know, there's this term called, if you will, church hurt. Um, so mm. some people may deal with that. Some may, you know, they probably don't even know God and have a relationship with him at all. Um, you know, others, it's just not their preference. It's not their cup of tea. Um, and, you know, that's not necessarily my place to try to be like, hey, you need to do this. You got to do this. You know, it baby steps, baby steps. And that's just, you know, how they get to the truth is one day at a time. Now, yeah, you use the term church hurt. Are you referring mm -hmm. to people having traumatic experiences coming up in the church because of how who they are and how they identify today? Definitely. Exactly. So um, I've definitely come across a lot of people that have unfortunately experienced some, um, you know, some issues and some tra uh, trauma that does stem from, you know, um, unfortunately, some members in the church. But we have to remember that church is literally that it's people. You're going to get pretty much hurt no matter where you go, unfortunately. And ideally, you don't want that to necessarily be in the church. But you know, you have to realize that these are people and mm -hmm. our role is to, you know, forgive, to pray and, you know, ask God the best steps to, you know, how to move forward. Now, some churches have been losing membership over the past decade and some people have left mm -hmm. Christianity altogether for a different kind of spirituality. Some have turned to Yoruba or Ifa, which is a traditional African spiritual practice that hails from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you know, Pastor Tipton, have you seen examples of this? Not that in particular, but um, I have seen folk become so disillusioned with where the world is right now. Um, everything is okay now, and the world wants the church to accept everything that the world accepts. And when a church makes a stance on whatever that may be, uh, then persons are, are hurt, they're uh, they make a decision that I'm not going to deal with that. This is my best friend. They're engaging in whatever. And if the church won't accept their behavior, then I'm not coming. I'm not coming as well. And that happens a lot. I, I'm believing uh, with the younger generation more than, than older. Uh, Omarion, have you seen examples of people leaving Christianity and the church for different types of spiritual practices? Uh, yes, as both as a chaplain and as a pastor, I've uh, experienced it and seen it happen. Uh, I think uh, just as uh, Kalela lifted up um, about church hurt being very real and what Pastor Tipton is uh, alluding to as well, that persons are looking for something um, and often they think that it's going to be different from um what they already understood or what they've been entrenched in. I got to understand that just as persons are looking for traditional African uh, or traditional um, uh, methods of worship and, and, uh, and religion, uh, the church goes back 2000 years, right? And the first churches are, are, are Coptic in there in, in, in Africa. And they're in places where, we that that didn't deal with what we know in this westernized culture of of church uh and and national uh, uh christian nationalism and in and in how we have these doctrines that are set up that are man made and that mm. are promoted mm. so it, it's anytime you start to get a great group of people together more rules more um, segments or sets or, or things that appease or apply to what they want to believe will occur um, persons I have, leave. I, I have a minute yeah. left. I want to ask, I want to try to get sneak everybody in on this last question. What can the black church do to broaden its reach and connect with people? Uh, Kiela, we'll start with you first, real quick. Yes. So to broaden and to connect a little bit better, I would definitely say be intentional and go out and reach um, no matter what they look like. Um, you know, absolutely starting with, you know, our black brothers and sisters, start with them and then expand and reach them. Be intentional about it. Pastor Tipton, share the love of Christ. Be be what Christ has called us to be and be consistent with it. Omarion. Same way. Yeah. Be consistent and be intentional. 
All right. I want to thank you all for being here with us today. I want to thank you all for this conversation. I wish we had a lot more time because there's so much to dive into. Amarian D. Lee is spiritual, is the director of spiritual care at Nashville General Hospital. He was joined by Morris Tipton, who is pastor of First Baptist Church of East Nashville in Kiela Hampton, a member of Born Again Church. I want again, thanks to you all for being with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. We want to thank everyone who tuned in this hour. Tomorrow, y'all been watching the World Cup. We know you have. So we're going to learn more about the significance of soccer for our Latino communities here in Nashville. Tune in. This is Nashville is a production of WPLN News and Nashville Public Radio. Listen back at thisisnashville.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Our producers are Steve Harouche, Rose Gilbert, and Magnolia McKay. Our digital lead is Anna Gallegos Cannon. Michaela Elias is our technical director. Our executive producer producer is Andrea Tutto. Shout out to our intern, Tori Hoover, and the masterminds behind our theme music, LaRange and Namir Blade. The conversation doesn't end here. Tweet us at This Is Nashville. Find us on Instagram and let us know what you want from our show by filling out our quick survey online. This is Nashville. I'm Khalil Ekelona. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. And be good to each other.